In today's episode, we dive into underwater archaeology to talk about shipwrecks, barrels, and networks of trade. Welcome to the Medieval Grad Podcast. It's a podcast brought to you by Medievalists.net, where we chat with graduate students and early career researchers to learn about the new trends in medieval studies. I'm Lucie Lemonnier, a medieval historian and the podcast's host. And today I'm talking with Jeroen Osterban, a PhD candidate in archaeology at the University of Leiden in the Low Countries. Hello, Jeroen. Thank you very much for being here. Hi, and thank you for having me. So first, tell us what got you interested in pre-modern archaeology. Um, well, as, as a contract archaeologist, I worked uh, a lot in this uh, on pre-modern archaeology. And that was mo mostly caused by um, well, the way the contract archaeology in the Netherlands, where I worked, uh, developed. Well, in the last couple of decades, a lot of well, the, the, the urban planning was within the cities themselves. So, yeah, obviously, we found most of the medieval and early modern uh, uh, features there. So that that's the way I got interested in uh, the pre-modern archaeology and got fascinated by it. I got introduced in well the way the archaeological uh, records uh, coincides with the historical ones, and you combine those two to well be able to get, get a lot of information about uh, this period and well the way this period is still well decisive for the way at least the low countries are um, yeah laid out right now and w what sparked your decision to do a phd although because you were working before as you said as a contract archaeologist well i uh, executed a, a couple of big archaeological projects myself for instance there's this one in uh, vlissingen which was uh, uh, done at the Grote Markt, the, the big market, as they call it. So right in the middle uh, of, uh, of Lissingen, where we found a lot of these barrels and casks, 85 in total. And that sparked this enthusiasm uh, on my part to well, be able to understand it more. And while elaborating this project, I um, was, was searching for uh, well, background literature on this specific topic and actually couldn't find it. There is uh, very little known about the, um, uh, the barrels and cask from archaeological context. So I saw this knowledge gap where I um, well wanted to jump in. So well, I'm just two years in my five year project right now, and I'm yeah, trying to get a grip uh, on the barrels and cask from archaeological context in well, not only the medieval period, but also the early modern period. So 13th till 18th century, and I just concentrate on, well, the Netherlands and its, well, uh, direct surroundings, uh, as we call it, the low countries. So Belgium and uh, a bit of Germany, modern Germany is also included. Thank you. Well, that was the perfect transition uh, towards the next question, which was about your PhD project. And you, you already mentioned that you, so you study um, barrels and uh, casks to look at trade networks between the 13th and the 18th century. Uh, so tell us about the artifacts you study, the barrels and the casks. Uh, many of them come from shipwrecks. Is that correct? Well, yeah, a, a lot of them do, but uh, a lot of them also don't. You know, I just, um, we found a lot of them in urban archaeology, so in city centers as well. And they're, uh, this, well, packing material, this is what uh, barrels and casks are, are often reused as a shaft or a water well or a cesspit. And in that way, we, uh, we actually uh, have a lot of them in urban archaeology. On the other hand, there are a lot of them from shipwrecks as well. But the ship's wrecks aren't always that good preserved or elaborated on afterwards. So we uh, rely a lot on uh, the data sets from urban archaeology. Uh, and uh, a big big part of my data set is also built on, well, this kind of archaeological research. Then you got, uh, well, the downside that the original content isn't, well, there anymore. You know, the, they're reused as a shaft for a water well or a cesspit. So there aren't, the, the original contact is gone and the, the bottom is also removed to be able to get a couple of them on top of each other and, and um, well, let them function as a shaft for uh, uh, this purpose. So that that's kind of, well, conflicts the situation, but it also presents opportunities because, well, you're able to get a, a grasp on, on a longer life phase of uh, this material. 
from the construction, uh, you know, production of the, the packing material, all the way to the reuse of it. So the the, the barrels and casks are well a, a fascinating object to uh, to study. And you, know, you ask about you know the the, the artifact uh, of the barrels and casks. Well, what what are those artifacts? And well, I think everybody knows this this wooden cylindrical container uh, with slightly bulging uh, uh, sides made of staves. They're all hooked together, and they usually got two bottoms on each part. The, uh, the majority of the medieval casks are approximately 15 staves um, bound together by well eight wooden hoops, and well on on each side you got a bottom, and usually each each bottom consists of three different parts which are bound together. So that's that's the puzzle that we are sometimes uh, confronted with. Because we found a lot of them also in shipwrecks, and they're all well uh, in pieces actually, and it's up to us to piece them all together. And so, how do you use uh, these barrels and these casks to study trade networks? Are you able to know where they were built compared to where you found them? Is it about the the tree species that was used or maybe some kind of artisanal techniques that you are able to trace back to a place of origin um yes yeah, yeah. what we archaeologists uh, often do is that we just concentrate on one specific fine category i use um, this packing material as an indicator for the spread of trade networks um, to be able to tell um, which uh, f- from which trade networks a specific cask or barrel was part of is really important to be able to tell which original product was transported within now what, what was the primary cargo in this specific cask yeah that, that's hard but really important uh, step to do luckily uh, we have um, well, some ways to to be able to tell which uh, which cargo was uh, was within. There are three ways to link cars to specific products. One through their dimensions, as we see, there is a lot of uh, regional and diachronic variation uh, uh, within uh, the dimensions used for specific products. But we're able to tell um, that the the size of, for instance, uh, a wine cask in uh, a specific area in a specific period has um, uh, a prescribed dimension mm. so if we're able to tell when and where the the cask was made then we're able to uh, tell through the dimension which product was transported within so dimension is one way to uh, to be able to link the specific product to uh, to a cask then also we got um, the marks on the speci- uh, on the um, cask and barrels. Marks, for instance, are found on wine barrels. Uh, wine gargers uh, make their own specific marks on the on the barrels. Uh, excise tax has to be paid um, yeah, based on its content, so it's really important to be able to tell what the content actually was. So uh, they left marks uh, on the, uh, the cask themselves. So when we find those wine gogging marks on, uh, on the cask, we're able to tell that this was used as a wine barrel. Um, the third way is through residue analysis. Um, the residue analysis is actually based on the idea that uh, the residue of the primary cargo uh, remains on the inside of the staves. Uh, since the wood always absorbs substances, this is uh, well still the reason that, for instance, whiskey uh, matures in, in port barrels. Um, the expectation then is that the primary cargo is also you know, measurable uh, in the inside of the staves. So we use different met- methods uh, within this uh, residue analysis. Um, well, the first one is uh, XRF. The, the, the X-ray uh, um, well, way to be able to, uh, to do the residue analysis. Usually it's, uh, it measures metals, but we can also use them to measure uh, chloride, uh, for instance, which is always obviously used um, in the salt to pickle the herring. So when we find a lot of chloride, 
uh, through the XRF measures, we're able to tell that it probably was a, a herring barrel. Um, the second way of the residue analysis is the GCMS. It heats a sample, so each specific element enters its volatile stage separately. So we're able to tell which specific element was in uh, the sample. So when we combine those two different methods of residue analysis, so the XRF and the GCMS, we're able to tell through residue an, uh, analysis what the primary cargo was of the specific cask. Hmm. And I'm wondering how specific you can be. Like, okay, so you, you found a cask, you know, it contains, let's say, olive oil. Um, do you, can you say just broadly, oh, it was from the south of France because it was that size and there was this mark? Or can you be more specific and say, oh, that was the, from Marseille or, oh, that's Tuscany, specifically Prato? We're trying to distinguish the main products which were transported within uh, uh, this region. I want to be able to, to, to distinguish these three products, wine, beer or herring. Um, I hope we are going to be able to distinguish, uh, for instance, the Rhine wine from uh, the wine from uh, from France. Uh, that's the two main um, main regions uh, the wine get imported from uh, through uh, to the Netherlands. As we say, um, yeah, we have Dordrecht as one of the main places, uh, main harbors where the wine was imported, and we see that a lot of wine from uh, uh, from the Rhine, uh, the, the region around Keule, and from uh, France, we see uh, well a lot of wine important to Dordrecht, the city of Dordrecht as well. And uh, we hopefully were going to be able to tell um, which cask came from what region. And I'm uh, really hopeful we're going to be able to do that because well, there are completely different regions and we saw we see a lot of regional differences in the way those uh, the spec material was set up. So hopefully only, uh, for instance, only the dimensions of the cask uh, is yeah, going to help us to distinguish those, uh, those two different products. Let's move on to your preliminary findings. What did you learn about trade networks in the Middle Ages from the barrels and casks? For starters, we see a huge increase of the, the numbers of barrels and casks from archaeological context. Well, as we say, we got a lot of them from uh, urban archaeology, but also uh, from uh, from shipwrecks. We see uh, an, um, yeah, a huge increase uh, in the numbers we see in archaeological context. That kind of well reflects the um, uh, the transition the trade networks go through from the 13th century uh, to, for instance, the 16th century on. Um, we also see a strong relationship between the, um, the trade location and, uh, and the site. For instance, we find a lot of herring barrels in the city of, uh, of Flissingen, which was famous for their, uh, their, herring, <clears throat> their herring export. Um, on the other hand, we see uh, a kind of things that go against our expectation. For instance, the, the Dutch city of uh, Eindhoven, there were a lot of really big wine barrels find, uh, found. Um, and this is against the expectation since Eindhoven was known to be a relatively small and insignificant farming settlement. So that's kind of, yeah, opens up eyes in this, uh, in this sense. How do these barrels and casks actually end up in this little settle settlement? And what does that tell us about our knowledge of the of uh, the trade networks we know so far, and a lot of the trade networks were uh, studied using historical sources. So, for instance, uh, the the toll station uh, administration we got, and um, this yeah the toll administration was used to be able to tell yeah which products were were transported along yeah the main rivers and the main harbors. Um, we actually kind of lose the grip on um, where uh, the products get transported to um, when they get transported to the actual uh, consumer in this sense. And that's where the archaeological record can really help us. And that's uh, why I want to well, use the barrels and casks to be able to tell which uh, well, spatial dis distribu distribution uh, the, the products actually 
went on in the last part of their journey. Yeah, what I also found, for instance, in the, uh, the Cooper's archive of Flissinger when I was uh, diving into that is uh, the calculation for the, the, the products and sale costs of herring casks. This really struck as uh, well, a good source. It was actually a note by uh, a Cooper uh, made in this sense. It is uh, 17th century. It's a bit later than uh, uh, medieval time, but still it gives a good sense of the cost, the production cost, and well, actually uh, the, the sale cost, the sale price of these uh, costs. Yeah, in, in the 17th century sold for two guilders and two stivers as we call it. And you, comp you can compare it to more or less 400 euros today or 600 Canadian dollars. So it was kind of well, kind of costly to uh, um, yeah yeah to be able to buy one of those uh, barrels or casks. So it's 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 also not that surprising that they restored a lot of broken ones as well. That's what we see um, in the in the Cooper's archives uh, as one of the main activities of the the people who worked over there. They were just uh, not all not only making the new uh, barrels and casks, but also restoring broken ones. And since, um, well, the costs are more or less uh, 400 euros uh, compared to uh, uh, the, the costs today, that's not that surprising. Hmm. Do you see any changes occurring from the 16th century onwards in the trade networks and the barrels and casks? Is there like a change in the early modern era? Um, the the Big differences in the Low Countries is the, the way the river, the medieval river trade, transformed into uh, uh, international trade. Yeah, we got a strong increase in the concentration on trade. This is visible in different, different aspects. For instance, the ships, they become larger. The ports, they become larger. Uh, the number of goods that get uh, transported become uh, way larger. But also the trade networks become larger. The conservation of products is more important, which has yeah, also influenced the, well, the extra uh, pull on uh, the barrels and casks. Because, well, they, they didn't only uh, function as packing materials, obviously, they also conserved uh, um, foodstuffs. Uh, because of their um, well ability to be well airtight more or less, and um, well and dark uh, also. So yeah, we can see that uh, for instance uh, all the uh, the voyages uh, overseas to well, on, uh, to the Americas, but also to other uh, to Asia, for instance, as uh, the VOC done uh, done a lot from uh, from out of uh, of Holland that we see, well, a lot of extra demand for the barrels and casks as a packing material for, well, uh, the, the transport of good, but also the provisions. As we see on shipwrecks a lot, you got uh, uh, one part of the ship which was reserved for the provision of its crew, but the other parts of the ship where uh, the, um, the cargo was actually held. Mm. And also the provisions, uh, also fish, beer, wine, um, and meat were stored in these barrels and casks. So there's a um, yeah, big difference on the way the trade networks were set up. Yeah, the trade network networks also got the, this uh, aim to um, uniform the, uh, the packing material. So the packing material actually got uh, more, more or less well, the same size when they get uh, later on from the 16, 18, and uh, and eight, uh, and yeah, 16, 17, and 18th century. Does it make them more difficult to distinguish? You know, like if they are more uniform, you cannot rely on the size and shape to know where they came from. Yes, but you know, in the, in, the, in medieval times, the the um, the political landscape is that fragmented that it's really that uh, each region has its own prescribed uh, uh, prescribed cost measure. So, and they also change through time. Uh, sometimes they, uh, they uh, adapt a different uh, size for a herring cask and yeah, 50 years later, 
they follow another prescribed uh, one. So it's, it's, it's that fragmented in the medieval times that it's sometimes hard to get a grip on a specific yeah. uh, um, you know, dimension. So when it gets more uniform, that actually helps us to uh, be able to, uh, to tell uh, different sizes and so different products uh, um, yeah, from dimensions of the casket uh, transported. You mentioned that um, that you are part of a project about a shipwreck from 1519 near Amsterdam. And so I was wondering if you still go on site, whether underwater or uh, in urban settings, to kind of collect these samples. Or now that you're a PhD student, uh, you just kind of receive the samples. Are you still getting your hands dirty? Um, well, I love getting my hands dirty. Uh, well, as a contract archaeology, I've, um, yeah, I've, I've dug up a lot of barrels and casks uh, the last couple of decades. Uh, the last years uh, within, well, my PZ study, it's it's really limited. <laughs> but I try to um, well to go out and do the field work myself sometimes uh, as well. There are a couple of uh, a couple of casks uh, from urban archaeology. I'm uh, I'm about to uh, to excavate. Uh, there's um, well, this couple I wanna wanna excavate uh, myself, but you know they're um, they're gonna be uh, sampled uh, thoroughly, and um, yeah, we're gonna be able to do the dendrochronological uh, research on this specific casks completely. When focusing on the the maritime archaeology, I, I I'm not a diver, sadly. And um, yeah, the, the Dutch waters aren't really uh, inviting uh, <laughs> to, uh, to dive in. The visibility is usually really poor and the currents are really strong. So uh, that kind of complicates um, you know, the, the being a professional archaeological diver in the Netherlands. So um, shipwreck uh, I'm working on, the Schuurak. Yeah, uh, out of uh, 1590 is researched completely already. So everything uh, uh, can just be placed on my lab table um, to do well the research I do afterwards. So no diving for me, sadly. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Jeroen. This was a really great interview. I learned a lot. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. That was Jeroen Oster. Oh my God. That was Jeroen Osterban, and you can find out more about his work in the show notes. Stay with us because the episode isn't over yet. Let's bring in Peter Konichny from Medievalist.net. Hi, Peter. How are you? What did you think of the interview? Oh, thanks. I'm doing good. And wow, residue analysis. Never <laughs> yeah. Thought, I never, <laughs> never thought I'd be talking about that when I started my uh, career in medieval studies. So, Well, you know so. me neither, because when I read... Um, uh, Jeroen's uh, bio on the website, I thought he was actually doing real, you know, like real submarine archaeology. So <laughs> I didn't realize he was actually analyzing residues <laughs> on yeah. old pieces of wood. The, he really should be going down, like diving off the coast of the Netherlands, see what he can find, right? That's what I was picturing him doing. <laughs> the, but it, it, it just goes to show you, like, you know, how much we're learning through physical objects these days, yeah. right? Uh, you know, like, like it, it it blows my mind uh, that, you know, we can learn about what wine, from what region, you know, we can tell, like, by just looking at a scrap of wood that was yeah. probably buried for hundreds of years, uh, and that can reveal so much detail that we never even considered, so... Uh, yeah, like I, I, you know, I'm just so impressed about what people can do these days. Yes, and it's very interesting. And what I also really appreciate about, uh, you know, projects in medieval archaeology is also that they usually go for a long durée perspective. So like a long time span. It's not just 14th, 15th century, like what we historians do. It's really about like 13th, 14th, 15th, 16th, 17th century. And yes, maybe you, you don't have all the details that you would have in a historical study, mm -hmm. but still gives a, a very solid idea uh, of what happened in a long time span. Yeah, and I, th I think it's a good lesson for like medievalists that like you can work beyond the kind of, you know, quote unquote, middle ages, uh, like because people didn't live you know, then think of themselves as like going from one period to another, 
like in the year 1500. So, uh, and it's, it's very, I think it's very useful when they kind of look at an archaeological approach where they um, can offer this wider span and, and inform us in that. Right. So yeah. yeah, I was really, I was really impressed. And uh, do you have any uh, readings you'd recommend to our listeners about maybe wine or barrels or oh, marine oh, archaeology? We we do have an article about the like best wine in the Middle Ages mm. and what what people considered best. And that was you. It wasn't for taste. It was more for like medicinal. Like what was like yeah. healthiest, right? Wine, but so but um also i i want to point out like another kind of bit of scientific you know research that it dealt with viking trade in the, to the middle east and it's been narrowed down to the year 775 oh uh, like that's when like that's when it kind of starts and it was done through using an astronomical event right so like uh uh it, it's all beyond me how it's done right but like if using Things that like happened in the solar system or along the you know that gave impressions, yeah. uh, and, and things like that it, to help actually make even firmer dates, right? So, uh, mm, so that was just okay. something that like came out a couple months ago in the news, and yeah, just again like another example of science and uh, technology being used to learn more about the medieval past. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Peter. Hey, thanks. That was the Medieval Grad Podcast brought to you by Medievalists.net. If you want to support us and to support this podcast, you can subscribe to our Patreon, patreon.com slash medievalists. You can get a lot of great benefits on Patreon, including being able to hear the podcast's episodes early. We love doing the show and we really appreciate your help. I'm Lucie Lemonnier. You can find me on Instagram. The handle is The French Medievalist. And you can look me up on academia.edu. Thank you very much for tuning in. Au revoir. <laughs>